cheering year after year. Who's got the ballpark? The best is all right here. Who's got the fans with so much Cleveland pride? Who's talking baseball? Talking tribe. We're talking baseball. Nineteen ninety four the inaugural season at Jacobs Field a season of hope and dreams realized a season that had everyone talking tribe from opening day through the dog days of summer pennant fever had struck we've got the players these guys are really hot we've got a future we're headed to the top. We're on the warpath. We're spreading far and wide. We're talking baseball. Talking tribe. You're talking baseball. Talking tribe. Hello, everyone. I'm Tom Hamilton. For the next 30 minutes, we will take an insider's view of the building of Jacobs Field relive the excitement and the pageantry of the inaugural season at our new ballpark. Remember highlights of yesteryear and talk to some of the key players as we take a look at Indians baseball at Jacobs Field. Just the beginning. Professional baseball is one of Cleveland's oldest traditions. 1994 marked the 125th anniversary of what has become our national pastime. Ironically, it's a year that will certainly be remembered as one of the most historic and emotional times in this city's rich sports history. Although Cleveland joined Boston, Detroit, and Chicago as charter members of the American League way back in 1901, our baseball heritage began years earlier. Cleveland's love affair with baseball actually began in June of 1869 when the Cleveland Four Cities took on the Cincinnati Red Stockings in the first ever professional baseball game on the shores of Lake Erie. From that historic moment forward, Cleveland would become the home to teams in the Federal, Players, and Negro Leagues, just to name a few. Joining the American League 94 years ago, Cleveland, however, wasn't done changing names. Nicknames for the club began with the four cities and included names that were derived for all kinds of reasons. They were called the Spiders once because their players were tall and skinny, the Blues because of the color of their uniforms, the Broncos so they sounded more forceful, and the Naps in honor of Napoleon Ladjoui when the club acquired the great Frenchman. Now Ladjoui's career was not going to last forever and when he was released in 1914, Cleveland was left without a name. The owners of the club turned to the fans in hopes of creating a name that would stick. Through a newspaper contest in one of the local papers, the name Indians was selected in honor of Louis Francis Sokalexis, one of the first Native Americans to play professional baseball. Today, 80 years later, baseball in Cleveland continues to foster his legacy. Professional baseball in Cleveland. 
rich in history and in tradition since 1869. Memorable moments performed by some of the game's greatest names. At a time when the Indians franchise was searching for leadership and direction, Northeast Ohio natives Richard and David Jacobs ensured the legacy of the national pastime in Cleveland, ushering in a new era of Indians baseball. The challenge that faced the Indians' new ownership was a secret to no one. The first order of business was to build an organization that could rekindle the love affair between a city and its team. Coined the blueprint for success, the plan was developed to first focus on creating an innovative player development system. A big part of it, obviously, for us uh, was to rebuild the farm system and rebuild the baseball operations department. And um, while we were rebuilding the baseball operations department, uh, the city, uh, the public, uh, the politicians, and the business community uh, were also busy, and that was putting together a state-of-the-art ballpark, uh, which was a big part uh, in this dramatic turnaround that we've had here with the Indians. The system was designed to stop the revolving door that was once at the entrance to the clubhouse and build an atmosphere where talented and exciting players could stake claim to the role of pennant contender. Uh, the city of Cleveland needed heroes and it needed players that were going to be here. Uh, with that revolving door that had been a part of Cleveland history, um, I think it came to a screeching halt uh, when we offered uh, multi-year contracts to the core of our ball club uh, several years ago. The second important part of the plan was the hope of building a new ballpark that would provide the stage to present Major League Baseball in the truest spirit intended. By now, well, you know the story. The blueprint has been well documented by fans and media alike all across America. It's a franchise that quite frankly had fallen on hard times and I think justifiably was one of the poorest run franchises in all of baseball. And so, with one majestic swing of his bat, a new era of Indians baseball was born. Well, it may not have actually happened that way, but just as the arrival of Albert Bell symbolized a bright future for this team, the demolition of the cold storage building, the last tombstone of a decaying area, symbolized a new vision for downtown Cleveland. The task at hand was monumental, almost like moving mountains clearing away the debris of the past in order to make room for the pride of today. How does a ballpark get built? Well, believe it or not, once the land is cleared and cleaned, the first order of business is the establishment of home plate. The geometry of the entire ballpark emanates from home plate. What did I just say? Well, right here, we're looking at home plate. And everything in the design and the construction of this project based right off of home plate, right here. All of the uh, dimensions of this facility, the location where the first piece of steel and the, the first slab of concrete and the first brick uh, are all geared right back to this point right here. Thank you. Didn't I say that? Oh, one more tidbit about home plate. Did you know that Major League Baseball desires all ballparks to be laid out the same? Thus, if you drew a straight line from home plate to the pitcher's mound to second base, it would be east to northeast. In June of 1992, a field is lined, a pitcher's mound is built, and the first game of catch is played at Jacobs Field as Charlie Nagy and legendary tribesman Mel Harder toss ceremonial first pitches to Sandy Alomar, linking the past to the present with an eye toward a bright future. What was once a cloudy picture had become more vivid. To anyone who had the opportunity to drive by the Jacobs Field site, the picture became increasingly more apparent each day as the steel began to rise above the ground. 10,000 tons of steel was used to build Jacobs Field, much of which was poured right here in Northeast Ohio at the USS Kobe plant in Lorraine. an urban ballpark in the truest sense, both architecturally and aesthetically. Jacobs Field was built within the boundaries of three main streets in downtown Cleveland. A sense of Cleveland was shining through daily.
Jacobs Field begins to come to life as its exposed steel design, which matches the many bridges on the North Coast, its vertical light towers, which match the smokestacks of the industrial zone and the many high-rise office buildings, are just a few of the architect's features that blend perfectly with Cleveland's cityscape. The erection of the $9 million scoreboard, the largest freestanding scoreboard in North America, with script Indians perched on top, made even the staunchest naysayer believe. After years of discussion, planning, and actual construction, Jacobs Field truly came to life when in September of 1993, the playing field was installed. A mass of steel and concrete was now a ballpark. The final piece of the puzzle, the installation of the seats, was the one major element remaining, the beautiful hunter green seats creating that cozy, intimate feeling. The field is ready. The seats are in. It's time to play ball. The modern day Cleveland is the essence of baseball in America, the greatest example of what the game can do for a city. Like so many classic parks of the past, Jacobs Field is built within the confines of the city. They built the future, ditched the past, and created one hell of a present. The plan was in place. The foundation of both the baseball team and the ballpark were laid. They were on a parallel course designed to eventually connect to come together in a defining moment in Cleveland's rich baseball tradition. Target date, April 1994. April 4, 1994 signaled the beginning of a new era for baseball in Cleveland. Move over, great ballparks of America. You've got company. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, please welcome a very special guest, the President of the United States, Bill Clinton. The park, the team, the city have created a synergistic explosion of goodwill. Today, this field of dreams has become a reality. And boy, this reality has certainly exceeded everyone's expectations. What a beautiful ballpark, and what a gorgeous Monday afternoon as Rich Amaral steps in, Dennis Martinez winds it up in the season's first pitch, a called strike on the outside corner as Sandy Alomar flips the baseball into the Indians' dugout, and that becomes a part of history. An historic moment as a new era of Indians baseball is underway. The first ever American League game at Jacobs Field provided everyone the chills and thrills only a Hollywood scriptwriter could conceive. For seven innings, Seattle's imposing left-hander Randy Johnson had been nearly perfect, not allowing a single hit until. And the delivery. One on line for the right side of base hit. And stopping at second base, Danny Maldonado. There is the first hit in Jacob Field for an Indian. Danny Alamai has it. And the Indians with runners at first and at second. Nobody out here in the eighth inning. And for the first time this afternoon, this big crowd has something to cheer for for the Indians. Alomar's hit sparked the tribe's offense. And rookie Manny Ramirez stepped to the plate. Manny Ramirez stands in. Ball one. Long drive, left field, way back. It's back, it's going, it's off the wall. Two runs will score. In the second base is Ramirez with a double. And listen to this crowd. The Indians have tied it here in the eighth. 
Fitting of the emotion of the day, it seemed appropriate that the inaugural game of the inaugural season at Jacobs Field would go extra innings. Let's pick up the action. It's the bottom of the 11th. The score is tied with one out. Eddie Murray has switched hitter batting from the right side. Bottom half of the 11th inning, we are tied. And the pitch. He drives deep to left field. Back goes Griffey. He's at the wall. He leaps. It's off the wall. In the second base, Eddie Murray. He makes the turn. He'll stay right there. And the Indians with a runner at second. Eddie Murray missed ending this game by a couple of feet. King pitches. Sorrento drives it deep to center. Back goes Griffey. He is there on the track. He puts it away. Tagging and going to third base is Eddie Murray. Randy Alomar in the eighth inning against Randy Johnson with the Indians trailing 2 0 and not having a hit, had the base hit through the right side. They're going to put him on. They will be pitching to Wayne Kirby. Three balls and a strike. Here's the pitch. Line drive, left field, base hit, the game is over. The Indians win it. Wayne Kirby coming through with an 11th inning base hit. A drive, a victory today, 4 to 3 in the first game ever at Jacobs Field. Oh, what a finish. Well, I had a chance to look out and uh, really see this, this crowd come alive. And, uh, and then as the game went on, it was one of those storybook ball games that uh, you'll just never forget uh, forever and a day if you're an Indian fan. Uh, they go ahead in the ninth, we come back with a big Jim Tomey pinch hit, and then uh, Wayne Kirby uh, rifles a bullet down the left field line, and uh, we had the first of many celebrations at home plate. There's nothing like opening day. I said one time I wish every day could be opening day because as a player, um, your bat is real quick, <laughs> your feet are real light, your energy level is sky high, and, and everything, even if the sun's not shining, it is somewhere in your, inside you that it's shining. So, you know, you, you wish every day could be an opening day. As the inaugural season unfolded, no one was quite sure what to expect, but there was something special, almost magical, that developed early in the season that would set the tone for Indians baseball at Jacobs Field. It started in mid-May. There's a high drive, deep left field, way back, way back at the fence, it's gone. Oh, what a belt by Albin. Swung on a drive to deep left. Back goes Bourne, he is on the track, at the wall, it's gone, a home run. Albert Bell in the 13th inning wins it for the Indians. Albert Bell is 12th home run of the year, is fourth hit of the game. And the Indians win it four to two. There's a drive deep right. That's going to end it. What a belt. Way back in the second deck. Paul Sorrento has just ended this game with one of the longest home runs hit at Jacob Field this year. What a blast. The Indians win it three to two. I think this was a national story, uh, as well as a, as a great local story, because uh, for years Cleveland had been the butt of a lot of jokes. Uh, I think uh, uh, as we've walked into the uh, end of this particular plan that we've had, that, uh, I, I think everyone in the country, had, there was a little bit of the Cleveland Indian fan in everyone in the country. 3-2 pitch, swung on, driven deep to center, way, way back, at the wall is Huff. This game is over. He hit it into the picnic area. What a belt. Jim Tomey hits a 3-2 pitch over the center field fence, and the Indians win it 4-3. Oh, I'm going to tell you, that was some drive. He delivers. Swing a line drive to center field. Base it. One run is in. Here comes Carlos Bayaga. Here's a throw. The Indians win the game. How about that? Three runs in the ninth inning. The Indians have beaten the Boston Red Sox, and you should see the bedlam on the field. They are mobbing Albert Bell. And I remember sitting on the bench and, and watching Carlos come around 
third base going home, being really excited and saying, yeah, yeah, this is fantastic, it's unbelievable. And then ha halfway home, I lost sight of Carlos because the entire bench went on the field and ran with him to home plate. I, I don't ever remember not seeing a man score because your bench was on the field, but they actually ran, ran in front of me and, and, and to the home plate. Set is the pitch. High fly ball, third base side. Alvaro Espinosa in foul territory in front of the base, puts it away. The game is over. The Indians have won nine games in a row and 18 straight here in Jacobs Field. From opening day, uh, there were nothing but great comments about the ballpark. And I think as the ball club began to play up to its expectations that uh, this town just went crazy. And, uh, uh, I think uh, just the, the, the smell of the ballpark, uh, uh, the capacity crowd we played to every night, uh, these fans were not going to let this club lose. It was widely known that everyone enjoyed the new home of the tribe, but the big question in the 1994 season was, what effect did the new ballpark have on the players? As you would expect, it had a profound impact, all positive. And if you can't feel good about working in Jacobs Field, then, then, uh, then you need to go have your sanity check somewhere because this place is, is state of the art. I mean, it's it's a, uh, it's a, a workout facility. We've got a, a weight room that has over three hundred thousand dollars worth of, of uh, training equipment in it. Uh, we've got four indoor cages. Uh, we have uh, big meeting rooms, uh, a huge uh, clubhouse that's, that's a comfortable clubhouse, and uh, the training room facility with the swim max and the whirlpool. And again, I. I I can't imagine any other place in the world that has any better facility than we do. And I've had a number of people tell me that, people that have, that have been around this league and, and uh, been around both leagues and, and have said that. It's just a great place not only to come watch a ball game from a fan perspective, but it's a great place for a, for a ball player to come in and, and play in the game. The 1994 Cleveland Indians were a team built like its ballpark from the ground up. It was a team that produced. Albert Bell, he powered his way to another all-star season. Kenny Lofton was once again as good as gold. The incomparable Carlos Baerga just gets better and better. Sandy Alomar proved once again that there is no one better. Charlie Nagy rebounded to post 10 wins. The acrobatic Omar Vizquel displayed his unmatched style and grace. Youngsters Jim Tomey, Manny Ramirez, and Mark Clark took that next step. Free agent acquisitions Eddie Murray and Dennis Martinez provided that veteran leadership. While Sorrento, Mesa, Plunk, and Kirby played key roles to help build the excitement at Jacobs Field. The Indians averaged more than 39,000 fans per game with three million fans on track to file through the gates at friendly Jacobs Field in 1994. Indians baseball at Jacobs Field became one of the most enjoyed forms of entertainment between New York and Chicago. The winning combination of an exciting, talented team playing in a world-class setting had fans and media all across North America embracing the rebirth of a city and its baseball team. cheering year after year who's got the ballpark the best is all right here jacobs field is an architectural and urban design home run it fits so deftly into its downtown site that it almost seems to have been there from the beginning of time nobody plays harder than the tribe who keeps you cheering
year in, year after year. Who's got the ballpark? The best is all right here. Who's got the fans with so much Cleveland pride? Who's talking baseball? Talking tribe. We're talking baseball. Talking tribe. It seems to be a case of love at first sight. A mix of exposed steel and brick, Jacobs Field echoes the city. It is at once industrial strength and friendly. We're talking baseball, baseball. talking tribe. It's everything a Major League Baseball field should be convenient, Cozy, real green, and interestingly lopsided. Almost no expense was spared to make this the finest facility in baseball. Jacobs Field might be the best place to watch a baseball game on the continent. Nineteen ninety four, just the beginning. Trip, son. How about throwing me a cold one? Just like old times, huh, Dad? Just like the old days. This isn't a Pepsi. I know. I saved nine cents. Unbelievable. Kid saved a lousy nine cents. <laughs> <laughs> 